Have you ever watched a movie and years later, one little scene still lives on in your memory bank and who knows why? Maybe something in the scene was amazing. Or maybe one day that scene was going to be important in your life. I had a scene like that. Any years ago, I was watching The Hobbit, and there's a battle scene. And Legolas appears on a mountain stream. His friends are in trouble, and he comes to the rescue. And it's so, so watchable because he's amazing. And he wins the battle on the mountain stream. for them. I, I've, It's only about 40 seconds, but I think it's worthy of a watch. This is Legolas in The Hobbit. Let's go, guys. Come on, give the man a round of applause. Save the day. <laughs> we watched that for a reason, believe it or not. We'll come back to it in a few minutes' time. But first, a question. What are we all here for? On the earth, I mean. Seven billion human hearts beating on a beautiful blue planet spinning through space. What are we all here for? Each one of us dreaming dreams, making plans, meeting friends, crying tears, waging wars, singing songs. Most of us will get approximately two and a half billion heartbeats on the earth. What's it all for? on this beautiful blue planet? The best answer I've read in my lifetime is a few stunning words in the center of the Bible. It's our Creator speaking about all of us, about His big purpose, His dreams for you and I. These words were penned two and a half thousand years ago. It's God speaking to you and me about the reason why he says this if we could put this slide on the screen that would be great I will give you a new heart I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh I will put my spirit in you you will be my people I will be your God. I put my spirit inside of you. And you'll be mine and I'll be yours, says the creator of the galaxies. Think about that for a moment. Your father in heaven, the maker of the universe, says something like, I have a dream for you. That one day across the earth, there will be a community of people, men and women, young and old, rich and poor, who will carry my spirit within them everywhere they go. They will walk so closely with my spirit that their hearts will beat like his heart. They will feel what he's feeling. They will say what he's saying. When you listen to them, my people, it will be like listening to my voice because we're living in harmony. When you watch them live, it will be like watching my son. Their thoughts will be his thoughts. Their words will be his words. And there will be upon this earth a people who don't just exist. They will truly live. They will be my people, and I will be their God. And they'll walk with me in the cool of the day. They'll talk with me through the storms of life. And they won't settle anymore for the shallows. They'll swim deep with the Holy Spirit. That's God's dream for His world, for you and for me. And just in case we didn't know what that looked like, the Father sent the Son to model it for us. Jesus came to show us how to live in sync with the Holy Spirit. And His life 
with the Holy Spirit, the Son of God and the Spirit of God, living in perfect harmony on the earth for a few short years of time. That was the greatest duo the world has ever seen. The most pure and powerful partnership history ever witnessed. Son of God and the Spirit of God in a dynamic dance that raised the bar for humanity forever. Because Jesus came to show us how it works to live as a friend of the Holy Spirit. This is how one writer who'd watched the life of Jesus in wonder summarized what he saw. Next slide, thank you. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. And he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. That's the most brilliant summary of the most awesome life ever lived on planet Earth. Because now, suddenly, the dream in God's heart had a face and a name. He was flesh and blood Jesus walking amongst us with the Holy Spirit. The relationship between Jesus and the Spirit was like pure white light shining on the earth. And Luke's account of the life of Jesus is like a prism that splits that white light down into seven colors. We see seven characteristics of the relationship between Jesus and the Spirit. It's so helpful because as you read the story of Jesus and the Spirit, you realize he's modeling this for us. We can be like this now. And every one of those seven characteristics of the relationship between Jesus and the Spirit can be our experience too. Luke tells us in the first four chapters of his gospel, let's look at the next slide. He tells us this. He says, Jesus was born of the Spirit. So are you, my friend. When you reached out to Jesus, he ignited life in your heart. The Holy Spirit gave you birth. The Bible says you were born again, but this time born of the Spirit. Just like Jesus was ignited in his mother's womb by the Holy Spirit. So you and I are brought to life again, conceived by the Spirit. You have eternal life pulsing in your veins, my friends, because you were born of the Spirit. Jesus was then touched by the Spirit physically at his baptism. And the Spirit will physically lift your body when you need it. Just like he did for Jesus. Jesus, it says, was filled with the Spirit. From the inside up till he was overflowing with divine life. That's your life and mine. We can be filled with him. So we only splash the life of Jesus Everywhere we go, we're full to the brim with Jesus' life. And everybody gets a splash of it when we are jolted. Jesus was led by the Spirit, even in the deserts of life and the tough times of his life. The Bible says he was led through it all by the voice of the Spirit. And so are you and I. He'll be the lights that lead you home, the Spirit of God. He'll lead you when it's dark as well as when it's light. Jesus, it says, in those four chapters of Luke's gospel, was empowered by the Spirit. It says he was anointed by the Spirit, which refers to the specific, special gifting that comes with your commissioning. Anointing is when God gives you what you need to fulfill the commission on your life. It's very specific, very personal. He gives you what you need to be the person that you are being on the earth. A priest was anointed to be a priest. A prophet was anointed to be a prophet. A king was anointed to be a king. Mark was anointed to be Mark. Ruth was anointed to be Ruth. Wendy, you're anointed to be Wendy. Isn't that beautiful? There's only one of you, Wendy. Only you can do Wendy in the beautiful way you do. And he anoints you. 
for that commission. And then finally, it all turns around and the Luke chapters 1 to 4 tells us that Jesus will baptize you and I into his Holy Spirit. He will plunge us into the same Holy Spirit that he was drenched in. And we will come up drenched in the Holy Spirit. Streaming him through the world. So that was Jesus. Now we have an example to follow, don't we? Now we know what it looks like to swim deep with the Holy Spirit. Because Jesus did it for us. And the disciples of Jesus utterly embraced it. The first followers of Jesus, they just got this. They were wide-eyed with wonder and they understood. They just watched a man live a life the world had never seen before. In partnership with the Spirit of God. And they thought, bring it on, let's go. And for a generation, first followers of Jesus turned their world upside down because they understood that it's our turn now to live in partnership with the Holy Spirit. In Acts 2, they waited till the Holy Spirit fell upon them. And then they abandoned rule-bound religion because that is rubbish. And they embraced Spirit-led living which is utterly beautiful. They left behind the shallows and swam deep with the Holy Spirit. It was beautiful to behold. It changed history forever. All around them, people were getting healed. Lives were changed. Families were transformed. Beggars were fed. Churches were built. Cities were saved. Nations were reached with good news. There were miracles everywhere. Because the children of God understood that it's our turn now to live in the power of the Holy Spirit. It's like a million little Jesuses crisscrossing the globe, filled with the Holy Spirit, looking just like Him. Even a group of non-Christian observers looked on in that first generation and said of the Christians, they are turning our world upside down. Hallelujah. And the secret of it all, just like Jesus, was the intimate, personal relationship that each one had with the person of the Holy Spirit. Last week, James Aubrey summarized brilliantly for us from the book of Acts seven ways that the early Christians interacted with the Spirit of God. The seven key references in the book of Acts where suddenly there's a glorious collision between the people of God and the Spirit of God. And what happened next was always exciting. And uh, next slide, please. And James showed us last week that those early disciples, they spoke boldly because of the Spirit. They served effectively because of the Spirit. They submitted absolutely to the will of God because of the Spirit. They were strengthened powerfully by the Spirit of God. They saw clearly into spiritual dimensions by the Spirit of God. They were sent supernaturally and they surrendered to the Holy Spirit's voice. And that's the secret of it all. That's the dream, my friends. That's the reason you're breathing on this beautiful planet right now this morning. To get to know the Spirit of God and walk the earth with Him. It's that simple. To be a friend of God on this beautiful planet through your ups and downs, in your days and nights, when it's easy and when it's tough, you have within you the power to rise above it all. You have a partner in life now. His name is the Spirit of the living God. He's the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, and He lives in you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Which brings us strangely to Legolas. 
as the first followers of Jesus, carrying their faith through their everyday lives, they notice something remarkable. So remarkable that they wrote about it. They noticed that as they faced up to sin and sickness, as they went to war against injustice and poverty, as they stood up to demons and darkness, as they challenged political power and religious hypocrisy, as they rose above persecution and opposition, the first Christians noticed that they had weapons at their disposal. Not military weapons, but spiritual weapons. Not natural talents, but spiritual talents. They had supernatural abilities just right there when they needed them. Early disciples, they had gifts given by the Holy Spirit that were just within reach for every moment. And that changed everything. They were like arrows in a quiver. They could reach for them at any moment. And suddenly they had a supernatural way of intervening in the circumstance. Read the book of Acts. It's incredible. It is like Legolas in action. Watching a New Testament believer filled with the Holy Spirit was like watching Legolas leap across the stream in the scene we just saw. Unafraid of anybody. Watch that first generation of Christians. Were they afraid of anything? No. Were they afraid of anybody? No. Because they were fully armed for the battles ahead. They had an arrow for every challenge. Weapon for every battle. I'd love to take a couple of minutes to share with you what their weapons were. What were the arrows? Oh, oh. We all want to be Legolas, really, don't we? I went to archery lessons just to try and be Legolas. It's embarrassing, isn't it? Gower, I just said to the guy, can I be like that guy in The Hobbit? He said, have a go if you like. <laughs> they gave me a quiver full of arrows. And I start, Dave Prosser is to blame for this. He, he went, didn't he? Your dad, I don't know if he still does, but he's proper archer, isn't he? If he was here, he would be Legolas for us right now. And, um, and, and they taught me, go, I can do it really well if I haven't got any kit. <laughs> but I am going to need a volunteer to be Legolas. <laughs> Doesn't Ashley look a little like Legolas? You've got to admit. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. Even with your mum and dad here to watch. Um, what do we like? Ashley, just momentarily, to be Legolas. Yeah. Come on, round of applause for Ashley. Come and join me, mate. There you go, my friends. I wonder if you could just stand there and look that way and imagine you're in battle. It's a mountain stream in Hobbit land. The enemies are coming after your friends and you need to defend them. It's okay, mate. It's okay. We got the real thing. Okay, here we go now. Right, my friend, what could possibly go wrong? There we go. How are you doing with that, okay? Are you right-handed? Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Okay, yeah. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, put your hand just below that, because your arrow's going to rest on there in a moment, and it's going that way. It's okay. Gareth, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> Gareth's leaving the room. <laughs> it's okay, Gareth. It's okay. The arrows are all imaginary. Oh, no, they're not. They're <laughs> real. <laughs> He's going again. Okay, what we need to do is, I think this is right. I think this needs to go over your shoulder this way so that, how's that going to be? So that, let's try the other way because I want them, I want them I'm making a mess of this, aren't I, mate? <laughs> can I, you can tell I'm a pro, can't you? I want, you're going to need a right arm to reach behind you. That's it. No, that's not going to work either. Okay, <laughs> just one more sec here now. Forgive me. We should have rehearsed, shouldn't we? Okay, right, excuse me. Yeah, you can get me later, mate. So, so let's have a go at this. It's got to hang this way. That should do it. Yes. 
How's that look? Does that look good? Can you reach those? Are you feeling cold? Yes, look at that. He's got it down, hasn't he? This is great. Now, okay, in real life, if this were a real battle, okay, you would just clip that into there. I know, I did my training. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Clip it in there, okay? It rests on there, and all you do is pull that back. Okay, yeah, that's per- yeah, exactly like that. That's perfect. Don't let go now, mate. <laughs> Look at this. Oh, seriously, how good is this? Okay, let go a sec, because there's one small detail. Does he, does he look like Legolas yet? What are we missing? Oh, dear, yeah, maybe. Oh, goodness me. <laughs> Would you believe it? It's amazing. Right, let's just slip this on now if we can here. Okay, this is good. How's this looking? Now we have a Legolas. Um, Yeah, Gareth, get a picture, mate. That's fine. Yeah, no problem. (laughs) I owe you big time. Honestly, I do ask. You're looking good, mate. Can you just stay there? Is that right? Yeah. Okay, right. So, just just hang in there because we're going to need you now. Okay, don't need to shoot anything. Just hang in there. Um, I need... um, Okay, what we'll do is, just so everybody relaxes... Because this was a demonstration only. We're putting that in there. Big sigh of relief from the trustees particularly. Okay. Um, I, need, um, I need three guys. Okay. Can I have Justin, Alex, and Matt just to be here now? Okay. There will be no arrows anywhere near that bow, so you can properly relax now. That was just a demonstration. Thank you. Just wait there. Okay. Stay with me, Ash. This will be over in a minute. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that does look good, actually, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> There's one passage of Scripture, and for this we'll need to go back to the slides in a moment, that describes the nine arrows that are in your quiver and mine. They are what we go in a battle with. They are the reason we can be like Jesus on this earth. They are the difference makers. They are the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will decide which gift in which moment, which person. The Holy Spirit will manage all of that, but as a people we have within reach, nine amazing weapons for the battle, nine incredible gifts that make all the difference whatever we face. And I just want us very briefly now to have a look. There are, we've got three people here. You're going to get three gifts each because these nine gifts, they cluster into threes. There are three sets of three gifts that are given to you and I so we can fulfill God's dream for our lives. Some of them, three of them, are gifts of seeing. Gifts that help us to see differently. Arrow number one. Could you you grab me an arrow from the quiver? It's quite hard to get back there, isn't it? Oh, arrow number one. Supernatural knowledge. Maybe somebody that you're going to meet has an illness, a sickness, a problem, a hurt, a circumstance, a challenge, and you don't know, and they know you don't know, but they desperately need help. They desperately need Jesus in the situation. And the Holy Spirit will give you an arrow called supernatural knowledge, a word of knowledge, and suddenly truth sets them free as you say to them, is it right that this is happening in your life? And they look at you in wonder and realize they're not alone anymore because God knew what they were facing. It's the gift of supernatural knowledge. Can I have another arrow, please, Ash? Thank you, mate. Looking very stylish at this. This is looking good, isn't it? He's doing well, isn't he? Yeah. Second arrow is supernatural discernment. This sees even deeper than the physical. It sees deeper than the circumstance. It goes deeper even than knowledge. It goes deeper even than the emotional life of a person. The gift of spiritual discernment gets to the very spirit of a person. You can sense maybe spiritual danger, maybe spiritual potential. Maybe you see God at work where no one else has seen it yet. Maybe you see the devil at work and no one else has seen it yet. But you see it so you can pray for the safety of the people of God. Spiritual discernment 
means we are never outflanked by the devil. But it also means you can see what God is doing, where God is moving. You can look at a room and see the Spirit of God moving in a person's life deeper than anything else. You just have x-ray vision from the Spirit of God. You could look at a person who no one else has noticed and see champion in them. You can call out the champion in a man or woman of God that no one else has seen. The spiritual gift of discernment. It's a game changer. It's an arrow in your quiver. One more, please, Ash. The third seeing gift. These are all seeing gifts. They're all about what we see and how we see. The third seeing gift is supernatural wisdom. That is when supernaturally, I've witnessed this so many times in my life, in the lives of believers around me. Sometimes I've been on the receiving end of the beautiful gift of wisdom when I didn't have a clue what to do next. And someone just speaks a few words of distilled divine wisdom. They whisper words of wisdom and they didn't get it from their own intellect. They tapped into the mind of God and said, what about this? And whole situations down through my life here in this church, I've seen entire situations unlocked by a moment of wisdom where suddenly one child of God sees a third way, sees another door that nobody else saw. Says, what if we did that? And you go, wow. We're in this building here because of a word of wisdom like that. Suddenly you see a possibility that everybody else was blind to. It's a spiritual gift of wisdom. And it comes in a moment just when we need it. And these three, they're three of the arrows of the Holy Spirit. Matt, can you look after these? These are the seeing gifts. Knowledge. Discernment and wisdom. I give you those for your journey, my friend. <laughs> then there are three gifts, which are gifts of doing rather than seeing. These three, gifts of seeing. Gifts of doing are the power gifts. The early disciples would look at a situation. Could I have one arrow there, my friends? And they would pray for healing, and a body would be healed. A dead person would rise. A blind person could see the gift of healing in a moment of time. And in a moment of time, any of you or I can just, just reach out in Jesus' name. And electricity will flow through your arm, arm, and through your hand, and through your touch. And a sick body will be well in the power of the Holy Spirit. What a gift that is. Second gift, thank you, in the doing gifts is the gift of miracles. The gift of miracles. When you look in at something and it seems impossible, and suddenly a miracle takes place, and the impossible becomes possible. I wish I had no time to talk today about the details, but one day I'd love to share with you my story, our story, and how the Spirit of God has just sprinkled us with miracles in moments of time. And always there was somebody there with faith for a miracle. And suddenly the impossible was possible. Because this is what the Holy Spirit does. This is how he makes our lives like Jesus. So there is healing. There are miracles. One more there. Thank you. And there is what the Bible calls the gift of supernatural faith. I was with somebody the other day, and I heard that very, I saw it with my own eyes. A sudden rush of faith, like a sudden divine certainty, like a Holy Spirit conviction, a sudden certainty in the heart of a child of God. That kind of faith can move mountains in a moment of time. If you watch it, it's electric. Sudden, I've been in situations where I've felt it and I know it has nothing to do with me. I've just walked into an ordinary situation, in an ordinary conversation, and suddenly 
a flame ignites. And I just believe. I believe what's going to happen next. And in that situation, you just get brave and dare to say it. And then watch everything else happen. So those are the three doing gifts. Just to, I give you the three doing gifts. Healing. Miracles. And faith. Carry them with care, my friends. Three more and then we're done. The final cluster of three gifts. We've had the seeing gifts. We've had the doing gifts. And the last three are the speaking gifts. Let's begin with one arrow, please. Let's begin. This just makes me go, wow, every time I think of it. Imagine if in a moment of time you knew what God was thinking, you knew what God was feeling, and then you knew what God was saying. Wow, wow, wow. And you could put God's breath on your lips. It's called prophecy. The gift of prophecy is not anymore just for the superstars. This isn't about Isaiah returning to the earth. We don't need that. Now, by the power of the Holy Spirit, because it's an arrow in our quiver, ordinary people like me and you have an arrow in that quiver called, I can prophesy, inspired by the Holy Spirit. I can say what he's saying and speak creative words into the universe because his breath will fall upon my lips. The gift of prophecy. And something even deeper. Something almost mystical. It's so beautiful. One more arrow. Thank you. God's people in the first generation, as they walked through the earth in Jesus' name, they would speak mysteries. Watch this now. A person might be in a gathering of God's people or just alone praying, and they would feel so stirred deeply by the Spirit of God, deep in their innermost being, deeper than their rational mind, even deeper than their native language. They just knew that they had to urgently pray something or say something, but they didn't know what. This is spiritual living now. This is living in the spiritual dimension. They didn't know what. They just knew that there was a moving of the Spirit of God deeper than their mind, deeper than their language, and that they needed to put on their lips words that would heal and save and change something in the world. And they'd speak in a language they never learned in school. Was it a language of the earth or a language of heaven? I don't know. It could be either. I've witnessed this. When a person has spoken a language they've never learned and it's been a language of the earth. It's been a real language, supernaturally on their lips. A language from across the world, somewhere they've never been. Other times the Bible spoke, speaks about the language of angels. But in those moments when the Holy Spirit stirs you and you just know, I have to pray something, but I don't know what. And from your lips comes a cry deeper than any language that you know. And you pray in tongues for something you might not even know what. I wish I had time to talk about lives that I know of that have been saved. Lives literally saved across the world because somebody somewhere else was woken up prayed in tongues for them because they didn't know what was happening in that person's life. The person was literally about to be assassinated in a political attack across the world. And in the middle of the night in Swansea, somebody was praying in tongues for that person but didn't know what to pray. So let the Holy Spirit do the praying. And a life was supernaturally saved. I know a pastor cried out to God in tongues 
tears streaming down his face as he drove up a motorway. He didn't even know why he was so moved and so sad. He just knew somehow as he prayed in tongues, he was saving lives. But he knew nothing of what had happened back in the hometown where he was a pastor. When he got there, he discovered there'd been a terrible disaster and many of his church, his flock, the people he cared for, had been there in that disaster. I remember it well. I watched it unfold on the news decades ago. And somehow, in a way that they could never explain, every single member of his church, every, if you like, lamb in his flock, every single person he cared for as a pastor who was in that situation, every single one of them got out unharmed. And they all said, we don't even know how. Something supernaturally got us to safety. And their pastor remembered that tears streamed down his face. He was, he was praying so gutturally, so from inside of him. He didn't know what to pray, so he prayed in tongues. He had to pull over and park by the road because he was weeping, for he didn't know what. When he got there, he realized the Holy Spirit was saving lives. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Gifts of the Spirit are amazing. They're the difference makers. They are how we live like Jesus on the earth. One more, please. Thank you. So the gifts of speaking are prophecy and tongues. And sometimes what we've described will happen publicly in a gathering. This combination of gifts literally saved my own life from shipwreck one day. Sometimes publicly a person will be moved to bring a message in tongues. If you've been here for a, more than a few months, you might have heard that happen. And it brings us all to attention. It's as though inside of a person they know this is not just for me, this is for us. And they speak a prayer or a prophecy in tongues deeper than they know. And the Bible says, pause if that happens, because someone in the room will have the gift of interpretation. God is just standing us to attention, and we've done it so many times here, we wait. Whenever it happens, it changes a gathering. It breaks us into new realms of the purpose of God, and somebody else in the room will know the interpretation of the message that was just brought publicly. Tongues is not always for public, but occasionally it's a public gift, the scriptures describe. And if it happens publicly, press pause on everything else because God has just broken into the gathering. He wants our attention. And we wait. I heard Gloria do this. Brought a, an interpretation to a tongue just recently. And into the silence, God speaks. So those are three speaking gifts. My friend, I give you prophecy. I give you tongues. I give you interpretation. Carry them with care. For these will win your battles. They will win your battles. They will make you extraordinary for Jesus' sake. I don't know about you, but... Oh, thank you, Michael. <laughs> thank you, Michael. It's you that's laughing, Ash. Is it getting warm in there? Yeah, it is. Um, do you think we should let Ash stand down? Because he has been a hero, hasn't he? Uh, let's give a round of applause to Ashley. Thank you, mate. You're amazing. Couldn't have done it without you, mate. Yeah, thank you. I put that on, is it? I need it more than you. Thank you very much. Thank you. One more big clap for Ashley and for the boys. Thank you. Take your seats. So I take those off you. I'm going to hand these personally to a trustee so he can relax for the rest of the morning. Mark, my friend, could you look after these for me? If it's with you, I know we're safe. <laughs> we have to separate those for health and safety purposes. <laughs> I wonder if I could invite you to stand. Maybe the band could join us. I don't know about you, 
But I can't read the story of the life of Jesus without crying out to my God. Would you just make me a little bit like that? Are you like that? Just read about Jesus. You think, Father, could you make me a little bit like that? I can't read the book of Acts. Flesh and blood people like you and me without my heart saying, God, could you make us a little bit like that? Could we turn our world upside down in Jesus' name? Could we be Jesus to our generation? Could we carry a quiver of nine arrows through our life and be supernatural people?